Welcome everybody to the first conference of the CLI James Legacy Project. I'm really pleased to see everybody here today. I'm really pleased that people have emailed in internationally again to say they're sorry that they can't be here, but they wanted to send messages of support, messages of solidarity, because there are people all around the world who respected CLR James, respected what he stood for, but most importantly, want to make sure that his ideas stay alive, stay living, and stay relevant to the population. My name's Andrea Renisu. I'm going to be chairing the first session of this conference today. I'm from Hackney Unites and also head up the CLR James Legacy Project. We've got a whole range of speakers over the course of the day. I hope you've all got the programmes, but we're really privileged that Selma James, CLR James's widow, is going to be speaking in the first session. We're at the Workers' Educational Association today who very kindly agreed to host this conference for us because they realise the significance of it and they realise the significance of CLR James. And I want to start off by introducing Peter Caldwell from the WEA who's going to say why we're here today. Welcome everybody and I'm absolutely delighted on behalf of the, the WEA that we've got such a good turnout on a Saturday for this important event. If I could just start off with one or two Thanks. I would really like to thank uh, yourself, Andrea, and um, Hackney Unites and the Legacy Project for the work you've done in sustaining, the, you know, the memory and the importance of CLR James's work and, and here in Hackney and for your work going into this event. I would like to thank um, my colleague Monica for liaising on behalf of the WA and enabling the WA to be part of this. And obviously, um, I'd like to um, thank the speakers for coming many of whom have played a very important and distinguished role in, in these issues. I'm not a speaker on CLR James, but I am actually a great fan of his and, and, and came across his work uh, way back when I, was, um, when, when I was a student. And I think his contribution to Marxist thinking and left-wing thought is, is, is very important. And just really to comment on three strands of it, it, it within the... The, the, the left and within Marxism, who, who very much emphasised to me the creativity of working class people, the concept of self-activity, which I do think is a really important thing within left-wing thought and actually also within ad adult education, which is, is what the WA is about. Clearly he drew attention to and really focused on the leading and creative role of the black working class, uh, particularly in America, and, and, and I think that's that's extremely important because people from outside of America um, have different <coughs> views of the American working class and often neglect the, 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 the radicalism and the importance, particularly within that, of the, of the, of the black working class. Yeah. My final uh, connection point with that, if you're into politics and you're into sport, <laughs> then the connections within them are important. And I, I, I consider... Um, CLI James is Beyond a Boundary, one of the great books written on sport, if not the greatest book. I did read your um, excellent uh, tribute to it and comment on it, Selma in the Guardian. And there is a copy of Selma's review of or celebration of Beyond a Boundary there for people to read, and I, I, I very much um, recommend it. I did write down the quote because I always get it wrong. What do they of cricket know who only cricket know? Which I'd, I don't need to sort of labour the point, but if you look at contemporary sport today, the connections with politics and race and that sort of thing are everywhere to be seen. So that's, that, that's very important. So to, to me, I did actually put my name down to come on this purely as a participant, and then um, Monica asked me to introduce it, which I was obviously delighted to do. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here. I'm delighted to welcome people here. I'm sure it'll be an excellent day. I'll vacate the platform and go sit elsewhere. But thank you very much indeed, and I hope it's a really successful day for everyone. Cheers. And Goma Bishop will talk in a while about the campaign that led to the launching of the CLR James Legacy Project. But before that, we have our main speaker, privileged that she's going to be opening the first session of this conference, Selma James. Thanks very much. I'm glad to be part of this. I'm glad to be part of promoting the legacy of CLR James. And I, but I have to say that, that what that legacy is varies from group to group and perhaps person to person. My interest is very much like the brother who just spoke. My interest 
is the political legacy of CLR James. And I have, I'm speaking today about a book of his which is not um, technically political, but which I think is very political, and I'll say why. <laughs> Everybody has a right to celebrate a legacy as they choose. But I think it's really quite important, and I was glad that I was able to include it in the article on Beyond a Boundary, that the framework of CLR's mind, um, especially from the time he came to England in 1932, but certainly by 1933 when Hitler came to power, in Germany, which transformed the world or gave warning that the world was about to be transformed, the frame of his mind was political, the frame of his mind was Marxist, not, I'm glad to say, in the sense that we usually know Marxism, but de delving a lot deeper and finding another Marx from the one by, that by 1960 we knew. Um, I was part of his organization, his Marxist organization in the United States, and it was the frame of reference of my mind, although I was not uh, well educated, not well read, just a high school girl from the working class, and uh, I have to tell you that one thing that has Im that I understand was a speech and uh, understand about myself was a speech that he made in 1951, where he said, "My friend and I, uh, speaking of me and my friend Philomena, who were." We were by then 20 or 22 great ages. He said, those two girls or those two women only know what we have taught them. Now, he didn't mean we didn't know anything because he used to ask us a lot of questions and really hang on our answers. But what he meant was the frame of our minds had been uh, shaped by the politics we had been involved in, in the organization which he led. And I think that that has been crucial to my life and crucial to the work that I have tried to do and to what I have tried to be honestly and <coughs> entirely committed. The story of this book Mariners, Renegades, and Castaways is an example of that, which is one reason why I chose to speak about it today, this question of the frame of your mind and what it is you want to accomplish and what it is you want to be committed to and how you want to relate to others who are perhaps less familiar with some of the things that you think, what you want to do and how you want to do it. CLR James wrote Mariners, Renegades, and Castaways because he was an immigrant to the United States who they wanted to deport. He was a, a, an immigrant who was on the verge of deportation. We know about that. There's a lot of people like that. And he wanted to make the case to stay in the United States. And what he chose to write about was Herman Melville, who is one of the great writers. Now, I asked him once why he made his focus Herman Melville rather than Tolstoy. You know, everybody says the greatest novel ever written is War and Peace. I don't think so. I think it's Anna Karenina, if it's any one particular novel. But he said, I said, why not these? And he said, because Tolstoy doesn't have the working class. What Herman Melville chose to write about 
was fundamentally life in a factory. That's what he wrote about. He wrote about life in a factory which was a ship. It was about the captain, the crew, the stratum in between, the, the, the hierarchy in the ship. And he wrote about it as a picture of the entire world because the people who were boldest and bravest and in fact led the work in the ship which was to get, which was to capture whales, the people who did that work were three men from the third world, an African and two people from islands somewhere I can't remember exactly. They were the harpooners, and it was they who led the work. But what he says in the book, in, in Mariners, is that it was the work that he wanted to know about, and the people who did that work, and the relationships among them, and their relationship to the secondary leadership, and their relationship to the high leadership who was the captain. And he said it was because of that that he chose to write about Herman Melville. Tolstoy had much to recommend him, but the working class and the class struggle was not in his books, and therefore he chose that to concentrate on, and especially that to concentrate on in dealing with the American state and making his case that he, as an outsider, had understood really what was tremendously important in the great American novel. And this was part of his contribution to the United States for which they should allow him to stay. Now, I think he was a bit naive. They were not about to let him stay because of the time that it was. This was 1952-53, when McCarthyism was riding high. And it was not till eight or 10 years later that the American elite split. It was on the Vietnam War that they split, in, where if it had been made then, he would have stood a chance to stay. But 52, it was all against us. Uh, and. It, the book was not about to succeed as a weapon, as a weapon in his armory for his case to stay. Now I want to say how the book was written. It was not written like any of his other books. He was on Ellis Island. He was in a, a detention center called Ellis Island. A few years ago, I visited it for the first time. It's now open to look at. Windows are broken, but you can see that it is a horrible place like any detention, detention center in the 50s. It was a prison, fundamentally. And he spent some months in there, and in the course of it, wrote a draft of this book. We had a way of dealing with ideas within the political organization, <coughs> which was a bit unique. We usually, when people wrote manuscripts, gave it to other people to read, working class people mostly, find out what they thought of it, what they liked, what they didn't like, what they didn't understood, what they didn't understand, and on that basis, redid the book so that it would not only be a representation of what the organization thought, but it would also be <coughs> speaking to, to the public outside, because who is in your organization but it, the public outside, you know? That's who your organization, if it's any good at all, is made up of. In this case, it wasn't sent to everybody, it was sent to me. I was in California, I was working in a factory at the time. I was sent a book and I read it and I made some marks about things that impressed me. 
or that I liked particularly. It was a good story. I never read Moby Dick. I hardly heard about Moby Dick. And I sent the manuscript back to the person who was tremendously involved in servicing CLR when he was in this prison. And that's a woman called, she was called Grace Chin Lee, and now is Grace Boggs, and is quite well known in her own right. Grace looked at it, and she must have gone to see him, and they discussed it. When he got out of detention, he had lost the case or was losing the case for the right to stay. He looked at the book, and I was to come east at that time with my little son. He's not little anymore. And do a piece, uh, and do some political work. And among the things that I would do would be to type the final <laughs> manuscript. And the deal was this. The book was completely to be rewritten on the basis of the comments that I made, which he complained to me were not that many, but that they had figured out, he and Grace, that what working class people wanted was the whole thesis in story form as much as possible so that it was graspable and entertaining. And to do that, he rewrote the manuscript. And as he rewrote it, I would read it. And parts that I didn't understand would be rewritten or that I found difficult. And then they would put jokes in. And if I didn't laugh, they'd take them out. I remember that in particular because she said, I remember Grace saying, what did you think of the joke? And I said, what joke? <laughs> and she said, that has to go. Anyway, and then I would type it. And I have to say, the CLR had a very difficult handwriting, really beautiful handwriting, but very difficult because he had a very strong <coughs> hand tremor. And so you had to get to know how to read uh, his manuscript. And then the whole manuscript was finished after chapter six. And then something else happened. Chapter seven was treated a bit differently. Uh, Grace typed it, and it was presented to a group of us to discuss. Now, I have to tell you, for those of you who don't know the book, chapter one to six is a description of life on the ship and the relationships among those people who worked and those who were in charge. It then developed into uh, an analysis of other things that uh, Melville had written and the position of the intellectual in society. It's kind of a damaging description of intellectuals, which he thought had later had gone too far, but it's there in the book for you to read it and to make a judgment about. But chapter seven is different. Chapter seven is about his life in the detention center and what he thought were the relationships there and what he thought of the political people there. And he discussed it with us and how he was presenting our politics as it related to chapter seven, as it related to the relationships in the detention center. And we weren't all happy with what he had said, and it is still a contentious section of the book, and I'm not going to go into that. I, I have to really to think about it before I do. I have to say, before I go on, that reading the book was like no book that I remembered. It has such an entirely different meaning now that the world has changed so much. The book came out in 1953. That is 60 years. And in 60 years, a lot has changed in the relevance of the political analysis that it makes. We are different. The Cold War is over, for example. 
and that makes a, that kind of outdates some of the things in it. But I also have to say that much of it is deeply relevant, only it has to be updated. And I want to speak about that. First of all, the central character is Ahab. Now, Ahab is a, a, a captain who's crazy. We know about those. We have them as presidents all the time. That is not unique to us, nothing, to, uh, nothing that we have to discover there. But Ahab is monomaniac. That is, he ha he's, he's a maniac, and he's fixed on one thing. And he doesn't care where he ends up in order to get what he wants. OK. By the way, he's anti-racist. The closest person to him is a little black child who seems to be the only person that he loves on board. There was still slavery in the United States when the book was written, bear that in mind. But what he, how he describes Ahab, he says that is the kind of Stalinist or Hitler that we know is this kind of person. I didn't find that. I, it, you know, they, the, those who lead us are insane. There's no question about that. What I thought was tremendous about Ahab is that it described in detail self-indulgence. It described the person who prioritizes how they feel over everything, over the whole of humanity, over everybody. What I feel matters. And at one point, Ahab says, you know, the owner of the ship is saying, you can't go chasing after a white whale. You know, think of the shareholders. You know, they, they, they fitted the ship. They made an investment. You, you must pay attention to the shareholders. He says, you know, where, what will your vengeance give you, give the shareholders? And he says, my vengeance will fetch me a great premium here. And he smotes his chest. And I say, well, I know a lot of people like that. I know a lot of people. I know that the political movement has been sometimes wrecked by that kind of self-indulgence, which the death of Thatcherism is the biggest attack on, because that's what Thatcher stood for. She stood for no such thing as society. Think of yourself. Maybe a few little people like your family, you can include them. Don't let them starve to death too much. But think of yourself. And that's, you know, that's Ahab multiplied many times over. It's an invitation that those who rule us give us every day that we are alive, that we turn against those who are most precious to us, those whom we desperately need, those with whom we make society and worry about our own feelings and how I feel about it, and I'd like to discuss my feelings, and I don't, I feel not this, and I feel that this is the touchy-feely society. We are invaded by it. We can drop it. It doesn't mean we're stuck with it. But at this moment in time, when we're burying Thatcherism, we're definitely going to be burying Ahab with her. So that's a, a portrait that I think um, that people really can use, although that was not its intention. By the way, I have to say that recently there was a, there was a, a little um, interview on, on radio, which I thought was very revealing, because the man said, we have to do this with the environment, because what we do now in 25 years' time, we'll feel it. We're feeling now the policies of 25 years ago. He explained scientifically how 
you know, we were going to be, we were already and would be in greater trouble in the years to come. And then they interviewed someone who was in charge of industry, and they said, well, what do you think about this terrible thing that the scientist is saying about us? And he said, well, I don't think it's convenient. You know, it's not good for the economy. And I thought that they are suicidally greedy in the same way that Ahab is suicidally <coughs> self-indulgent. And when I say suicide, I don't mean only theirs, but the whole of society, <coughs> because that's where the Pequod, that's where the ship ends up at the bottom of the sea. He speaks about the chain of command and then about the working class and how different they are from management from those, their, their betters, and how well they get on with each other, and how well they can work collectively, but that they have a grave weakness, and that is that they are charmed and almost mesmerized by Ahab's power, and that this prevents them from overthrowing him and saving their society, which is the ship itself. I'd like to go at another point, not today, at another point to discuss that in more detail and exactly how he explains it. But I, I did want to say why they do not rebel is a crucial question for us. And reading it uh, is terribly important for us to do, and it is certainly part, an important part of the legacy to see exactly what he has to say. The book was sent to every member of the American Congress, and nobody replied. I don't know if they read it. I don't know if they threw it in the trash bin but they, they didn't do anything with it, and there was never any comeback. We finished the book in Thanksgiving 1952 and celebrated with a Thanksgiving turkey and pink champagne. My first time with pink champagne, and I rather liked it. I don't know if that meant that I was on the road to corruption, <coughs> but I've been looking for pink champagne that tastes like that ever since. We studied the book, and we also sold the book for a dollar wherever we were to our friends, our neighbors, the people we worked with, and tried to circulate it. And here was a chance that CLR was working, was, was experimenting on to use a piece of fiction to, to put forward his politics and to speak about politics when it was very difficult to do so because you could be labeled as subversive if you were in any way political. You know, during McCarthyism, they read the Declaration of Independence to some people. You know, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are in, uh, endowed with their, by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that is, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And they said, what do you think of it? And they said, it's subversive. So in that atmosphere, you know, you had to be careful about what you said to your friends. But here was a book about Herman Melville, which was, in fact, preaching revolution, and we could get by with it. That's really all I wanted to say at this point about the book. I hope you will give me a chance at a later point to speak in depth about the very content of the book and how it more deeply relates to the moment we're in now. And I'm going to celebrate its 60th anniversary um, dancing for the end of Thatcherism tonight in Trafalgar Square. <laughs> Thank you.
I'm going to introduce Ngoma Bishop from the Black and Ethnic Minority Arts Network, mm -hmm. who, who led a campaign to keep the name of C.R.R. Jones on the library in Dalston. I can probably speak about the campaign for an hour or two. You'll all be pleased, no doubt, to know that I'm not going to do so. <laughs> so th this is a summary, obviously. It can be said, perhaps, that the campaign began about 25 years or so ago. And by that, what I mean is that the, the circumstances which led to the campaign, in fact, began about that time. Because about that time, Hackney, and, and, and CLR James, <coughs> for those of you who don't know, I, I suppose most of you do, the CLR James Library was and is located in the borough of Hackney, in Dalston specifically. And there was a little library little dilapidated, not, 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 not worse than other libraries, but it was a small non-entity of a building, really. But it was, you know, it was ours, the people of Dawson, it was our library. And at that time, people had a feeling that Hackney also was ours. People felt that Hackney, like places like Liverpool and other places, was a place that took the desires of its citizens seriously, relatively, compared to perhaps a lot of other areas in any event, okay? And it had a reputation of being something of a socialist, radical borough. Well, clearly it doesn't have that reputation anymore. <coughs> but um, we're, we're talking about in the 80s when it was more customary for people to, to, to argue and to fight for what they want and to explain to politicians that they were in fact there to, to, to act on our behalf. I don't want to deviate too much, but a lot of people have since felt that there's no such thing as a politician who, who, who acts on behalf of the people, but I, I would say no such thing at this point. Okay, so we had a library, and we had a situation where, like virtually every other place in the country, there was no focus on black literature whatsoever. A group of council officers, mainly black, but not exclusively black from Hackney, mostly working within library services, decided that wasn't good enough, and with the support of others from the community outside of the local authority, successfully argued that some provision should be made or some acknowledgement should be made of the contribution that African Caribbean people and others had made towards not just Hackney and not just literature, but to, to the wider society. And the council listened because, lo and behold, the, li the name was renamed or was named CLR James Library and we were, I was privileged to be there when CLR James himself and I believe, believe Selma attended the opening of the library and my memory is not what it was but it was about 1983 or 1984. So, so there we had a CLR James Library and you know we, it was proudly displaying his name and those of us who didn't know much about him which included myself had the opportunity to learn a little bit more about him and so on and so forth. So all was well and good as they say for a little while. Now Let's speed quickly forward to about 2011, when things were <coughs> happening. Areas like Dalston were beginning to reflect a different kind of attitude and a different kind of people and a different kind of priority. And the local authority, in its infinite wisdom, acting on our behalf as usual, with our, with our, uh, <laughs> with our, our, our needs foremost, decided, OK, what we need to do, we need to create an area that looks a little bit more like Chelsea <laughs> and, and less perhaps, I would say that, that, than Brixton, but that would be a, obviously Brixton seems to be going the same way. So they wanted an area that looked anything except what it now looks like, okay? And they wanted some of the plays and they wanted people like Starbucks and et cetera, et cetera. Now I have to say, this is my analysis. So this is the analysis of, of the organization which I chair, which is BEAM, the Black and Ethnic Arts Network. Our analysis was this. It was no longer appropriate to have a name such as C.L.R. James attached to a library in an area which they wanted to transform into a, a showpiece town centre. If you go through the area now and you look at the wonderful building which is now C.L.R. James, well, it depends on what your perspective is. And as an artist, I don't find it particularly wonderful, but it's symbolic, that's, that's, that's the main thing. And the, the, the point is that they wanted to create a, a square which... In their words, people would be proud to come to us if they weren't proud to be there previously, okay? Mm -hmm. And the name CLR James just didn't fit in. It, it, it somehow was going to send out the wrong signals. It might make people think that Hackney was a radical socialist borough or something, okay? So they needed to lose the name. So to disguise this, what they did, they come up with a ingenious plan. 
and they didn't want to be seen to be picked on, on those, you know, the CLR gems. So they thought, what we'll do, we'll take off all of the names off of all of the libraries, and we'll do something really inspirational and, and, and creative. And instead of calling it the Dalston CLR James Library, we'll call it the Dalston Library, okay? <laughs> Cut a long story short, <laughs> right? We had a totally different impression of what should happen than the local authority. And we suggested that it wasn't wise that they take away his name because we felt that conveying or recognizing the contribution of CLR James was also recognizing the contribution. It was doing a lot of other things, including recognizing and acknowledging the fact that African Caribbean people could create beautiful literature and we were a part of, of a lot more than, than perhaps what they thought we were. We put forward certain arguments and they put forward different counter arguments, but what happened was that they felt that we were in a position where what we say didn't really matter. They were unused to the community, in particular the black community, asking for anything and less used to them demanding anything. And they hadn't really come across such a situation since perhaps the, um, the, the 70s or the 80s. We demanded that the name C.L.R. James was still in the libraries, and they, just, they didn't even laugh at us. They just ignored us totally, okay? So we made a few phone calls, and I made a few visits, and people refused to see me and all the rest of it. So we decided to have one of these paper petition thingies. Andrea, who, who, who with myself, initially launched the campaign, said, well, you know, you can't be doing that in Goma. That's kind of 19th century. You've got to do this thing online. So I had no idea what she was talking about, but she explained, and we established an online petition. And within about 36 hours, right, we were astounded by the amount of people who'd signed the thing. And it, it sort of, it really brought me into the 21st century, I have to say, because I realized, okay, I have to move on. I have to get myself a mobile phone and things, right? <laughs> they, they gave all kinds of reasons why it was okay to take the name off. One of the things that they said, well, it's okay with the family. I said, what do you mean it's okay with the family? He said, well, we've, we've discussed it with the family and they're okay. And I thought, well, that's strange because I spoke to Selma um, yesterday evening and she knew nothing about it. And she knew nothing of the plan whatsoever. So a week later, we'd had, I have to say at this point, the people principally involved in the campaign were Beam as an arts network who were not really a political organization with a big P and Hackney Unite and the Hackney Gazette strangely came on board and, and, and gave us every support that they could. Professors and people from every country I'd heard of and some had never were coming online and saying, listen, it's madness what your local authority is doing Without the influence of this person, I certainly wouldn't be where I am now. I wouldn't be an eminent professor in the university of, of, of wherever. And it soon became apparent to the, lo to the council that this wasn't an argument that they were going to win. This wasn't a fight that they were, they were going to win. It was agreed that the name C.L.R. James was still in the library, to, to summarise. But we know they can easily turn around and change their mind in three months' time or in six months' time when they figure that either we've forgotten about it or the key people involved are no longer around, so it'll be easier just to quality. So we thought, you know what we need to do? We, didn't, we need to establish a number of things in order that it's going to be impossible for them to backtrack. Right? And essentially three things were agreed. We, thought, we agreed that there would be an establishment of a permanent exhibition to CLR James, which... I would say proudly sits in, 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 in the library, but it's a very, very small exhibition currently because we're still desperately looking for things to, 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 to enthuse it and to make it, to bring it alive more. And it's stuck somewhere between the staircase and Starbucks, but we're working on that. But the point is, the symbolic thing is, it's there. And it's very difficult. There's no way they can take that victory away. The second thing that we decided to do was to establish an annual lecture where we would talk about an issue of significance to the people of Hackney in particular. The first keynote speaker of the first lecture was the journalist Gary Young, and that went very well. That was about 14 months or, or, or so ago. The second one was last night, where the keynote speaker was Simon Woolley from Operation Black Vote, and the topic for discussion was the importance of the black vote. With your help, we'll arrive at the lecture for for next year. The third element of it is this. We also decided there would be an annual conference which would be led by Hatton Unite because the lecture is led by, by Beamer. And so this is the first of that. And 
which is why we're all here today. I'm going to stop at that point, but I'll be happy to, to, to discuss it further with people. If you want more information, we can either send it to you or we can have a chat afterwards or whatever. Thank you all very much, because it's very important. I have to say this. Sometimes people are inclined to give credit for the success of the campaign to two, three, four, and sometimes even one individual. We're not naive and we're not stupid, and we know that unless it was the will, of, unless all right-thinking people, which interestingly, and I have to say, covered the whole spectrum of humanity, we weren't just talking about black people and African people supporting the campaign. We were talking about every single individual who thought, you know what, as Selma has said, we will all define in our own ways what CLR James meant to us, what his legacy was. But he meant so much to so many different people that a whole range of people, which not only surprised me, but more importantly and significantly surprised the council who took them by surprise. So many people, in particular the public and people like yourselves, got up and said, we're right behind you, this cannot happen. We'll sign the petition. We asked for 20 people to sign a, um, an open letter. We had to choose 20 from about 300 people who put themselves forward. So I just want to say on behalf of the campaign and the alliance, which is the Legacy Project, thank you all very, very, very much. We've got a very brief amount of time if people want to make very short contributions or ask any questions. I seem to recall seeing stuff by CLR James, which had been mimeographed, addressed, I think, partly to motor car workers, UAW, um, a long, long time ago, which was under the name Facing Reality or something like that. Can you elucidate for us? Facing Reality was the name of uh, the name, the original name of the organization that we were part of yep. when we were part of uh, Trotskyism was the Johnson Forest Tendency when we went out on our own, we were called correspondents because we were, our organization was built around a newspaper that was written by and for working class people. At a later point, we called ourselves Facing Reality. A book named Facing Reality was named after the organization that was the order which is available to today and was a really ambitious attempt to work <coughs> out how to build an organization, what kind of an organization we wanted, which was a really a major contribution that CLR made to politics. <coughs> he did not assume that we should be a, va a vanguard party. He assumed we should not. And, uh, you know, I said to an audience yesterday that those who want to lead rather than organize with the grassroots are not good leaders. You know, if you want to lead, don't, anybody who wants to lead, don't follow them. They're no good because they don't, because they want to impose their own law on you. And that was our starting point, but what do you do instead was what the book Facing Reality began to discuss, only began, and I think it was a noble beginning, but it's not enough. And it was written over the Christmas of 1957-58, you know, end, the end of 57, a lot of it was drafted by Grace Boggs, and um, then it was completely redone by CLR over the Christmas until the beginning of January. So 58, if we know a few more things now with any luck than we did then. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Selma tremendously. We, as participants here, need to acknowledge uh, the presence of a tremendous uh, fighter and struggler uh, over a long period of time, and having the capacity to continue to struggle and be radical is not an easy thing. I'd also like to acknowledge the Hackney Unites and their efforts. Uh, my name is Devon Thomas. I'm from Brixton area. I'm from Jamaica originally, grew up in Brixton. My family were part of that Windrush generation. And I was uh, interested, firstly, regarding CLR and his contribution. The 
where he pioneered the use of literature and culture in the development of people's minds. Um, we had the whole movement later on in the 80s around cultural studies. And it's acknowledged now that he was one of the founding members of using culture as the means by which you enter and engage with ordinary people's lives. And was, I welcome tremendously your description of how you developed your methodology around that. Because he also then influenced a whole new generation that came on the scene in the US, Caribbean, and you and he were very much involved in the Caribbean independence struggle. Uh, and later here, and this is where I came in, these books, Mariners, Renegades, and Castaways, Beyond the Boundary, were part of the literature I had to hunt for in the 60s when I was coming to consciousness. The other literature around was very few, very little. The struggle you talked about getting black African Caribbean literature into libraries, into schools, was a big movement. It didn't happen because of the wisdom of those who were running library systems and education systems. The community had to struggle hard for it. In Brixton, we had a very similar struggle. We have building there called the Olive Morris House. She was a young woman who grew up in the area who trekked to China and met Mao, who went down <laughs> to Africa and met uh, an area and other people with small groups of people, very uh, tremendous young woman. She died, and we had, during that, very, uh, that upsurge in the 80s, a lot of our areas named after people like, uh, uh, like that. And we've had days like CLR James days and so on. But this attempt to embargify our area, when they came to regenerate those buildings, they wanted to take Olive's name off it. And we had to organize a local struggle. And in a similar way, there's now an exhibition to, to, to Olive in that building. And as you know, we're building the Black Cultural Archives National Heritage Center in Windrush Square, which is no longer Tate Gardens. And it's quite symbolic that Tate, you know, with sugar company, colonialists, and so on. So that struggle must continue. Another thing, this came around the 80s, the Radical Black Third World Book Fair was very influential in this. And we happen to be graced with the presence of Eric Huntley, one of the organizing committee people from there, and of a similar generation to Selma. And I always want us to acknowledge these elders because, as Selma rightly says, who initiated these things are important, and we need to acknowledge them and pass that baton on to our young people. On the cultural study, I do accept entirely what you say, that a book like Mariner's introduces or can give birth to the cultural studies you speak about. And that's really what, the, what there is a problem because what cultural studies leads to is more cultural studies. And fundamentally, that is not going to change the world. What Mariners leads to is political organizing. And I don't know another way to change the world besides that. Uh, depending on what you decide the way you want to organize. I know that there are problems there, but we do have to find our way to political organizing. And one of the things that I find difficult about the thrust for the legacy is precisely that it ends up in some cultural <laughs> development which is very entertaining, perhaps, and makes some jobs for some people and in fact, which educates some people too, which is terribly important. I, I don't want to put that down, but which does not confront authority and which does not change the world. It doesn't fight racism. It doesn't fight sexism. It doesn't fight disability racism. It doesn't fight the cuts. It doesn't fight austerity. It doesn't fight capitalism. So I find it limited. Thank you. That's one. No, sorry. I have to make another point. And that is, I'm very sorry that I forgot to bring today two quotes which I had carefully put aside. What CLR was doing at the moment he was doing it was new. But what by the 60s was happening was some extraordinary people were finding their way to the education of the public. And I want to mention two, just very briefly, I must. One is Frank Commode, 
who was a literary critic, and I found in his obituary a wonderful quote which I intended to read to you about how difficult, how much more difficult it was to write about literature for an audience that was not literary. Now, he didn't mean the same audience that CLR meant, ignorant people like me. He didn't mean those, but he meant something other than the specialist, and that's tremendously important. It's a very different orientation. Even more relevant, I know my chair is chasing me, even more relevant is the statement by a woman called Grace Wyndham Goldie. Now, she was a whiskey-swigging Tory who was absolutely brilliant and who was entirely at the disposal of the audience of television and educated a group of men, because they were all men, she was a woman, who became the leading lights in television in the 60s who were responsible for that was the week that was. You've heard about it. If you haven't seen it, you must. It was the most irreverent and pointed and hysterically funny program you can imagine. And she said to this interview, which I have in my special papers, she was asked, you know, what about, you know, you treat these subjects and you know, maybe the audience won't understand. And she said, if the audience doesn't understand, then something is wrong with the producers. He, she said, the audience, I treat the audience as people who are not informed, but they're not stupid, you know. And it was the 60s. It was the period of the movement coming up. And I will send those to the sister here so that if anybody wants them, they can have those quotes. But he was a forerunner, not of cultural studies only, of using culture to educate, but of making culture and information and everything available to the public so that they can understand it, and it's our responsibility if we are educators that they can understand it, and we have failed if they haven't understood it. That was the foundation of his work, and when I saw Grace Wyndham Goldie having said that, I said, to you, she wasn't in Johnson Forest, but she understood it, so that means that anybody can who wants to and who respects the audience. Kerry Dingle from the Charity World Right. I loved reading Mariners. I, I, all our group, who we've all been reading for about a year and a half, everything that we can, and we all really enjoyed it. So if you haven't read it, absolutely recommend it. You, it's one of those you can't put down. Like, it's so brilliantly written. The other thing that I found pertinent for today was the Ishmael character, you know, the, the sort of degradation of the intellectual and how they become, they can't get with the idea of a rising working class or anything, and in fact become quite desolate figures. I think he portrays that brilliantly, which is another sort of part of it. Second thing, on a completely different note, is pamphlet we thoroughly enjoyed, I wondered if you could shed any light on, called A Fireside Chat, which seemed to me to be one of the f most poignant and few things ever written which really explained America's role in the Second World War and challenged it and said that, you know, black people in America should not be fighting for American imperialism in Germany if they couldn't even get, you know, equality and democracy at home. And it was a very rare stand, and I think very important for Britain too, given young people here think that Britain fought the Nazis to save the Jews when we know that Britain actually didn't give a shit about what was happening in concentration camps and elsewhere. And I just wanted to flag that as something that not enough people, I think, realize that CLR was a bit alone on, but amazing on. On the fire, I've never heard of the fireside chat, but I know why Negroes should oppose the war, which is in one of the anthologies, which is very fine, on mariners, 
I think it's readable, and I think some of the writing is terrific, but I think that there is a reading there which is outdated. That's what I was pointing to. It is a terrific <coughs> book in many ways, chapter one to six. Chapter seven, I, I'm not sure about. I don't know. I want to think again. One of CLR's favorite stories um, was about being organizing with sharecroppers in southeast Missouri. Yes. And he said two groups of people were chasing him. Uh, this was in 1942 or 43, during the Second World War, when, when Negroes opposed the war w would have come out. And two groups of people were chasing him. One was the FBI, and the other one was the, was the Communist Party. And he was being hidden, and he, he used to particularly talk about black kids who would immediately recognize the FBI or whoever it was and say, no idea. I mean, they, he was being covered by all kinds of people instinctively. Uh, for that kind of organizing. But it was a great story which he always loved to tell. <laughs> Hello, my name is um, Emily Finch. I'm a history student and also um, a campaigner from Lewisham, um, from People Before Profit. But I just wanted to ask um, how you would envision allowing greater access to texts such as the Black Jacobins, which I first read this year and I, I couldn't believe how amazing it was and like, the history it kind of covered, which I never learned at school. And I kind of want to have that brought into schools in the UK and maybe France as well. How would you envision doing that in the future? Well, yeah, I mean, you just have to lobby and campaign. And also, uh, Christian Hogsberg's book with the play Black Jacobins is a natural for introducing a general audience and kids in particular to the struggle in Haiti. I think our problem generally is that we're very provincial. We're not really taught or taught to respect what happens in the rest of the world. So it's a big problem that when the movement comes up, as it seems to be doing, we will have health. 